You know what? I see the sun too. So, so sometimes we have to see the sun even behind all the clouds. There you go. So uh, first things first, um, of course, we are in week two of our three-week institute, and um, I know that you all are getting a wealth of knowledge that you can take back to your students, regardless of the discipline. So the one thing I'm extremely excited about is the fact that we have so many people from so many different um, disciplines who are represented here, not just historians, not just political scientists, but we have people from literature and rhetoric, uh, folks, sociology, social work, um, fine arts. dance, right. fine arts, education, right. all of these right. different right. backgrounds, anthropology, so right. all of these different backgrounds, right. and all of this information is fitting for what you all can do uh, and the possibilities of what you can do within the classroom and developing and also redesigning. Uh, your curriculum around the struggle for civil rights. So um, again, it is a pleasure being with you all for these three weeks. Just as an announcement, uh, we don't want there to be an uprising of people who think we're not going to the Delta, but I do want to let you all know because of the weather, if you have been tracking it today, of course, uh, we have 100% chance of rain, and even going up until the weekend, uh, there is going to be an 80% chance of rain and uh, because there is a tropical storm, so we are tracking that very closely. There is a possibility that we will shift the Delta trip to next week and next Thursday to be exact and move next Thursday's activities to this Friday. So we did want to put you all on alert. So if you all see something different from what we see in the weather, um, please be in conversation with us. <laughs> You know, as many eyes as we have on, on the forecast, that, that's wonderful. But we are, we are paying very close attention to that. But, uh, of course, I'm starting out today's session. I don't talk very much, but, of course, it comes with the territory. And um, if something I say doesn't make sense, at least I was cute today. <laughs> <laughs> so, with that said, let's, let's basically go back and start, and I'm not going to here at the mic the entire time, but let's go back to day one when Charles Payne was here because this is something I do on the very first day of class with my students, whether I'm teaching a civil rights course or an honors course called Virtue, Freedom, and Justice. I didn't come up with the title, so don't ask me how, how that came about. But it is also uh, just a, an advanced course for our honor students that took it. And I did say that I would share with you all that master narrative or that triumphant narrative that is uh, so often taught, and it's not just when we're talking about K-12 um, education. We're even guilty of it in higher ed, unless we have extensive background in uh, the history of the struggle for civil rights. But of course, this is what I always start at. At the beginning of the semester, I ask my students to go through, what's wrong with this narrative? And most often, they say nothing, everything's correct. But I always have maybe two or three students who go through and say, well, I don't see a representation of women. Um, why does it have to start in 1954 with the Supreme Court case? Because perhaps they've had a very different educational experience prior to coming to college. And, uh, and then many of them even agree by the end 1968 was not the end of the movement because we, even in the 21st century, we are still uh, in this ongoing struggle. But I also turn around and use this as my final exam question at the end of the semester because I want to be able to assess how much they have gotten and how much just starting out with this and the information between day one and the last day, how, how they evolved over time and everything about the civil rights movement. So that, that's just a little bit of, of what I typically do in helping my students think through, through the historiography. So by the end of this, this, uh, this institute, you all will all be uh, in historians. And this is a great way for historians to even break down the historiography because I found that my students think that this is probably the easiest way to understand historiography and how scholars are in conversation with one another in both changing and challenging and expanding the narrative on the civil rights movement. But um, 
I will share this, but Michelle and I were in a conversation just before we started, and Charles Payne said that he was the one who grabbed the gun. But of course, and she's checking now. He says it's a much up later for you. He told me. And Julian Bond is, is the brains behind the whole big picture, but we'll find out. But this is something that can be used effectively in the classroom in terms of thinking about the way in which uh, the civil rights movement is so often taught and how we can change uh, our students' thought process on that. So for the past week and a half now, um, and I'm going to do this with you all, the concept of, it was, okay, so Charles Payne. So we're going to make that change. It is a time longer than bridge. Okay. Okay. Well, Charles Payne. So we'll give him credit. He says following Bond. But following But Charles Payne. So uh, the concept of freedom is something, is something that we probably all engage in conversation about with our students on a regular basis. So I'm just going to ask y'all to take a few moments. Uh, this is an exercise that I stole from somebody at failure. <laughs> so, and typically I would do this on a whiteboard and as I'm trying to take a roll of something, I have students to come up and I just write the word freedom and ask my students, how would they define freedom in the 21st century based on their standards of living? So if you look just in one word, no more than three, and that makes it even more difficult, how would you define freedom in the 21st century? And then we'll go around the room and get, get a, few, a few of those definitions. So how would you define freedom in the 21st century? In one word, no more than three. Employment and diversity. It wasn't more than three? That does Employment diversity. Okay. And I want to write these down. No more than three. Educational opportunities. Okay. Educational opportunities. Oh. 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 Yesterday, Dr. Williams actually had a, a quote from Edgar Evans that, that really uh, eloquently summed that up. So, um, anyone else? So, so what I have here is um, employment diversity, educational opportunities, voting, civil liberties, uh, living wage, clean water, self-sufficiency, uh, pursuit of happiness, back to Africa, choice, agency, sexual. Um, Nonviolence and freedom isn't free. And of course, um, can I add one? Sure thing. Independence, possession of civil rights, ease of movement, frankness, or boldness. 
unrestricted use or access. But this is the picture I took at the end of doing this exercise. And of course, what I start out in the class is trying to get students to understand that there is continuity in these definitions of freedom for African Americans beginning in the antebellum period. And um, of course, education, access to the ballot, and the left side of the screen is what I wrote to be. Wage labor, land ownership, which also equates to economic empowerment, uh, mobility, and family. And some of these are things we've already discussed. You've heard this over the course of the week. But thinking outside the box, and you all gave some great answers, which also speak to what my students have written on the board. Someone wrote preservation to resist. Um, no restraints. Jobs, better schools, education, art, religion. Someone brought up here to it's something to the effect being out uh, unapologetically them. So living in their truth. Uh, but these are all the answers that, that the students gave, and they connected the, their own answers to these historical definitions of freedom. Because oftentimes when we teach history, or if we are teaching something to provide historical context, we often forget that our students can get so bogged down, and what we want to do is try to make these connections from the past to the present, or the present to the past. Because if we have a past that we can build on, of course, they, they understand the present that they're living in and that there is a roadmap for the future based on all of this information. So this, this is a wonderful exercise. And of course, my students started, they wrote these down. They began to track over the course of the semester how those definitions have either continued over time or they have changed. And most often they think about how they have been continuity over time with those definitions of freedom. So that brings me to my presentation today. Thank God for Mississippi, the Jackson Movement in Birmingham. So before I begin, I always have to say thank you to the Hanley Institute. <laughs> Yeah, 2007 was my first um, opportunity to share my research, and I'm not saying that was the first time I ever presented, but there is uh, one chapter of my dissertation that, um, that that was extremely groundbreaking, still is, I'm still a little, I'm hurt in some, some, uh, some degree that I have not moved forward in getting the manuscript out, but I am working on that. But of course, uh, this was an opportunity for me to bring some of the participants, and I will talk about this event shortly, but this is my opportunity to bring some of the participants to Jackson State University to share in that particular moment with me because they were so crucial to the research that I had done. I'm also going to thank John Dibber because he has inspired so many historians of the Mississippi Civil Rights struggle, um, me, being one, Michael Williams will give him credit, Emily Crosby will give him credit, and there are a laundry list of others. Francoise Hamlin uh, respects the work that he has done because she wrote a very critical book on the Clarksdale movement, uh, and a number of other people. But I met Dr. Dittmer when I was a senior at Tougaloo, High, uh, Tougaloo College, and um, I remember him writing in my book because I was a history group at the time. And any, any book that I read on the movement or anyone I had the opportunity to meet um, who came into the classroom, I was always trying to make sure I got their autograph. And he wrote in my book, and I, at first I was like, oh, this man writes this in everybody's book. But he wrote um, to Daphne, a student of great promise. And I was like, oh, he little does he know I'm going to law school. <laughs> But we, we, we see where, where that, that is, has um, turned out. But I also have to thank the veterans who helped me pull the project together. And with us starting out with that master narrative, one of the things I want you all to understand is, of course, it is about filling voids in the narrative, expanding the narrative. And that's what John Dimmer's local people did for me. And asking questions of the sources that were being presented to me in the classroom, and the first question I had to ask was, okay, these young people in Jackson were walking out of the high school, and if children were so 
uh, very much a part of the movement here in Jackson, that means they were part of the movement in other places. And then I never thought closely of, based on some of the images I had seen even as a child, I didn't even think about the, the footage of children in Birmingham. I thought those were adults because oftentimes that's, that's how mind processes things. And I was like, okay. Well, why has there not been a definitive work written on children's activism in the civil rights movement? So, some questions when I do make an effort to get my students to understand about youth activism. And of course, my research particularly focuses on children between the ages of 7 and 18, but I also extend that to college age to, uh, youth. And uh, what role the institutions play in African American life during the age of Jim Crow? And that is what we've been talking about over the past week, is uh, institution building, uh, struggle, power, and also freedom. In what ways the institutions shape, instead of shaping, shape the social and political views of youth during the Jim Crow era? Michelle Gildorf introduced me to a being transformed in a way in which is propelling them to get involved in the movement. So he really didn't know what freedom was, even though he said he did. <laughs> now, Mather Evers, on the other hand, was at one point conflicted about young people being involved in the movement, but of course he had a very deep commitment to um, staying right here in Mississippi and doing the work that needed to be done to uh, change the system here. And the quote says, as you can see, I do, plan to, I do not plan to leave Mississippi. I'm anchoring myself here for better or for worse. I hope better. But if the worst comes, I'll be in the middle of it. And of course, he, he was in the middle of it. Uh, you heard references yesterday that Megger Evers was a mentor to young students at Two Blue College. Uh, Megger Evers was also a mentor to high school students here in uh, Jackson as they plan to organize and mobilize the community around changing things in the capital city. But it was this man right here, despite some of his transgressions. <laughs> it's this man right here who connected these two cities. And that's where I come in to say that if it weren't for Jackson, Birmingham would not have been possible. In 1961, and I'm going to just give you all a brief snippet, when the Freedom Riders came in, James Bell was a part of that. And of course, he was here in the Jackson community, right over here in the Jackson State area. And he was recruiting young people, talking to them, going on basketball courts, playing basketball, going to the pool halls, and talking to them about civil rights. And these young people were so enthralled by what he was saying, and of course, this, this inspired them to become actively involved in the movement. Uh, you'll have an opportunity to meet Charles McLaurin, perhaps, if uh, things end up, if things don't change too much. He was one of those young people, and you'll see so many others a little bit later on in some other slides that I have. But um, James Bell effectively got these young people to protest in Jackson in the days that uh, coincided with the arrival of the Freedom Riders. And these young people from high school to college age were going to jail consistently from the end of May until July of 1961. James Bell was from Mississippi Delta, from Itty Bitty, Mississippi. Yeah. 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 I'm sorry. <laughs> Somebody's from Itty here. Is it somebody from Itty here? Nobody. I think they say But from Itty Bitty, Mississippi, uh, Mississippi, but also, um, associated with the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, and um, very actively involved, but of course, actively involved in the movement in so many different ways. And um, I'm trying to, when did he go to school with Dr. Nashville? He was in, in, I know he was part of the Nashville, Nashville movement. For, yeah. Okay. Yeah. He was in the seminary. seminary. He was attending he was seminary in Nashville. John Lewis and some of those other people. So, of course, he was surrounded by others who were actively involved in the Nashville movement, but came home, started inspiring young people, then shifted into Birmingham, where he was still closely tied to Martin Luther King. And, of course, he's in Martin Luther King's ear saying, look, this is what happened in Jackson. These young people were on, on board. 
with uh, getting involved in the movement, and they were extremely effective in getting another generation of the African American community to be, to be involved in the movement. And that was that was like the, the turning point where Martin Luther King was able to uh, support the inclusion of young people or this strategy of young people being involved in the movement. And of course, he was jailed on several occasions, and you heard Mr. Watkins mention yesterday, House Watkins say that he was jailed for contributing to the delinquency of mine. And, and this was a common phrase. Diane Nash was arrested here in Jackson for the same thing while she was pregnant, uh, and a number of other actors. But it was initially that conversation or this uh, boost from James Bell that prompted Martin Luther King to rethink student activism in Birmingham. And that was his wife. Yes. So um, I haven't, but let, let me say this. Um, one of the things that I have to do as, and I'm, I fall in the same vein as uh, Dr. Devlin, and thinking about how we push back the civil rights narrative and looking at the origins of the movement itself, I am one of those people who starts in 1946 with my research and the return of World War II veterans. And that is where my dissertation begins, with uh, an event that took place that involved students from the near high school. So I'm going to show a trailer for a documentary that came out just last year. That's why I'm saying. Um, but I will also give a very brief critique of that documentary as well, based on information that I was able to Jackson City bus to school. It was called the special bus. Always they had a sign in the bus where they put color on one side and white on the other side. Al yeah, Court got on the bus and he he took him a seat. And the bus driver had told him that he could not sit there. And he wanted to know why. Kept on driving until he got downtown. When he got downtown, he he got out of the bus and closed his door and went up the street and found the city police. And then we wanted to know why we could not sit. Why we could not sit on the bus when there were seats available and nobody was sitting in the seats. So 
Elport Chess was sitting on this front seat, and uh, he referred me, he refused to relinquish his seat for that passenger, making the case that this is a special bus just for black students. So um, the driver said, okay, I'm going to allow him to stay where you are, and he does drive to Dr. David, where you're staying, the King Edward Hotel, which is now the Hilton Garden. <coughs> Stops the bus there, notifies a police officer. The officer gets on the bus, beats airport checks, and takes him to jail. And of course, students are up in an uproar over what is taking place. The bus goes on, takes them to school, and they can't say anything to the principal, who I heard was I.S. Sanders, who was a part of the movement but could not be as active as he wanted to because he was a school principal and it could possibly lose his job. But the students went to, guess what, a history teacher, <laughs> and shared what had happened. The history teacher actively involved in the Jackson NAACP, but two, he can't get involved. He would only advise the students on what actions they could take. These students discreetly organized the boycott, and uh, with that said, they even sent a petition or will lay out their grievances to uh, the, the superintendent at the time was a man named uh, Kirby Walker, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, Kirby Walker, in a paternalistic way, said, okay, well, we'll make sure we replace Slim, who the students call him, the bus driver. We'll make sure we replace him with somebody who's going to be fair and treat you all right. And, uh, the students thought he was being terminated, but they saw him driving another bus. So, of course, that wasn't enough for them. They wanted him to be completely without a job. <laughs> so they continued to organize. And one of the people I, and in talking about the importance of community, one of the people I interviewed, her uncle owned the cab company. And you all probably know where I'm going with this. If we're talking about trying to coordinate an effective boycott where all African Americans in the city of Jackson are refusing to ride the bus to get a response to what has happened to El Port Chase in November of 1946. This person who was the secretary of this organizing committee contacts her uncle who was the owner of the Dottie Cab Company, which was located on Ferris Street at the time. And um, that is how students are able to get to, to and from school and others in the community are driving them from this area of Jackson to another area of Jackson just so they can uh, continue to get their education. And uh, there are some arguments that, as to whether or not the boycott lasted three or six weeks. I'm still working on that. But that just, that, that's this testament of youth activism during these precursor years, and you all heard me uh, mention this phrase of a precursor movement. So before there's a full-scale civil rights movement here in the city of Jackson, young people are organizing and they are understanding uh, that there is injustice and that there is unfairness here in the city of Jackson. And that is before, before Rosa Parks. And what Janetta Jordan says right here, as you see, we accomplished what we set out to do. So we know that Rosa Parks is not the first person to get up the white folks. Here in Jackson, Airport Chess had done it in 1946, and we never thought of it as a civil rights case. So trying to, it, the beginnings of making change happen for an entire community of people based on that experience on a city bus for high school students. Now, the NAACP was another institution that was extremely important and uh, building the next generation of leaders. And even in the late 1950s, Mayor Evans made a statement that uh, train up your next, um, train up the next generation, that way our leadership will not die. And that was one of the things that he was charged to do, and that was to increase the number of students who were actively involved in the youth councils across, across the state of Mississippi. Now, before I even start with that, I have to go back to T.R. and Howell, Dr. Magdalene. I'm going back to him. So, um, we talked about all these meetings that took place with the Regional Council of Negro Leadership. 
Uh, there was a meeting, uh, November 1951, of the United Order of Friendship of America that was held in Mount Bayou. And um, T.R.M. Howard declared, you have to be a black man in Mississippi at least 24 hours to understand what it means to be a Negro in Mississippi. That was the same for black women. That was the same for black children. And his critique of Jim Crow practices in the state of Mississippi ranged from the documentation of inadequate educational facilities, poor living conditions, and economic disparity to the absence of basic civil liberties. And he also offered these solutions to contend with issues that affected black Mississippians, saying that there must be, quote, support of all agencies seeking to make the race strong financially, an all-out fight for unrestricted voting rights, and a continued fight for better educational opportunities and longer school terms. And that, that's one of the things that children understood, is that education was a part of this, de or this definition of freedom, and uh, they were paying attention to the, the disparities and what was going on between uh, black education and white education. So in 1956, here in the city of Jackson, and, and by this time, there are only two youth councils that exist in the entire state of Mississippi. One is in Laurel, and the other one is here in Jackson, created right here in this community, which was the West Jackson Youth Council. And, uh, and you have heard some of the names that I'm about to mention, but I'll also just share my personal connection. This guy right here was my orthodontist. <laughs> um, Amos Brown, here to the right, is going to become the first president of the NAACP Youth Council. And um, very, very, very radical thinking at the time for this to be the 1950s, but also someone who is not going to just limit his activism to here in the city of Jackson. But when he goes to Morehouse, he comes back to Jackson on a regular basis to be able to participate in movement activities and organizing young people. So Amos Brown is the first president of the West Jackson Youth Council. These two sisters right here, does anybody remember the mention of uh, Sam Bailey? The name Sam Bailey. Sam Bailey was the president of the Jackson NAACP Youth Council. These were his daughters. So there again, there's this evidence of young people whose parents or family is a uh, families influencing them to be actively involved. Now, um, with that said, this was organized 19, September 1956 in College Hill Baptist Church right here in this community. And one of the things that's very interesting about Amos Brown, he became so outspoken, he traveled widely with Mecca Evers to national NAACP conferences and made a number of, uh, gave a number of interviews. And one of the most profound interviews that he gave was uh, with a Cleveland newspaper. And he talked about these educational opportunities that were not afforded to black children in the state of Mississippi, going back to what T.R.M. Howard said. Uh, he talked about deplorable facilities, second-hand textbooks, second, third, fourth-hand textbooks, uh, the fact that uh, you have large number of students per teacher. And of course, this information, this newspaper article, gets back to Mississippi. And Kirby Walker, who is still the school superintendent, decides that he wants to deal with Amos Brown. Mm -hmm. But um, with that said, he places a lot of pressure on the superintendent for colored schools. Uh, who, can't think of his last name right now, Gooden, Dr. Gooden. And he tells him, either you expel him from school, or um, either you get a handle on him or expel him. The, those are the two options. Amos Brown says no. But Major Edwards turns around and says, okay, if you decide to expel him, what we are going to do as the NAACP in the state of Mississippi is, um, we will petition to integrate Provine High School, which was all white. So that was the response. Amos Brown was able to stay at Jim Hill High School, but the response to that was the fact he was stripped of his leadership position as president. He could not graduate as valedictorian. 
he was reduced to graduate. It's a little Tory. There were other privileges as a high school graduate that came along with that that he was stripped of. But of course, that, that's how the system responded to this young man challenge. And I, I have a couple of primary sources I do want to share with you all. But um, before we take a break, uh, I did want to share this with you. Um, and this, this is 1957, the year after the West Jackson Youth Council is organized. And this is a statement from the members of Everett. The organization, and in some instances, recognition of several youth councils have brought a great deal of encouragement to the field secretary and others dedicated to the cause. For we realize that the success of this great organization lies within the men and women of tomorrow, the young people that you all saw in that previous picture, and all those others across the state of Mississippi who would make up the NAACP youth, um, youth council. Now, what we'll do is stop at this particular point, and I'll go through a couple of resources that you all can use in the classroom um, by way of the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. Uh, but we will reconvene at 10.10. 10. Moving into talking about a few primary sources that um, you all can make use of in the classroom and also moving forward with the narrative on why Jackson is so important in, in understanding these local movement histories. Um, you've heard it over and over again uh, in this past week, and I guess I can share my own personal story because it's pretty really much connected to, to what so many civil rights veterans have shared about their thrust into the movement. But um, many years ago, my family moved back to Mississippi from Tennessee. And on the first day of school, I shared the story, oh, I even shared the story with my students and they, they laughed at me. And then they started trying to figure out how old I am. <laughs> like, no, I'm not getting you the year. But one year, when I was in the fifth grade, uh, first day of school, of course, I, I was very excited to be returning to Columbus, small town Columbus, Mississippi, because we had moved to Murfreesboro for about two years, Murfreesboro, Tennessee. And uh, I checked the mail that day, and you all will laugh at some of what I'm about to say in the next few lines. But I checked the mail, and there was a Jet Magazine that came. And of course, black kids, we don't read Jet Magazine. We go immediately to see what the top 20 albums and singles are. So I was trying to make sure that my music collection, the very limited collection I had, was, was reflective of what I saw in that book that day. But as I was flipping through the magazine, I saw one of the most disturbing images that any, any child, black or white, um, could see. And I, I, it immediately piqued my interest, and I wanted to read. And of course, this was an anniversary edition of the Jet Magazine that featured the murder of 14 year old Emmett Till. And that was mine. I had always heard these stories about what happened in Mississippi during the Jim Crow era from my grandparents, but never had I been introduced to Emmett Till. I had always heard stories that were similar too, but that was my introduction to Emmett Till, and I think that that's one of the um, cathartic moments that perhaps um, solidified my passion for history and just listening to um, my family members. But uh, I'm just going to read an excerpt from my dissertation, and of course this is going to be uh, really closely connected to what you've heard other veterans say, or others um, in presentations. The murder of Emmett Till led to an increase in the national membership applications received by the NAACP Youth Councils. Nationally, the youth groups held rallies and prayer vigils in his memory. In Ernest Gaines' autobiography of Ms. Jane Pittman, the title character asserted that, quote, nothing out there but white hate and nigger fear, and the fear is the only way to keep going. But despite the murder of Emmett Till and the fear it instilled in many black children, and also this option of immobilizing black children uh, from activism, especially young black boys, many black youth still became involved in the movement. 
Uh, without a doubt, organization of youth, youth groups was paramount in mobilizing youthful political action after the Teal murder. While the murder itself drew attention to the problem of institutionalized racism in Mississippi, fear among the young people also had the potential to immobilize them. Yet youth participation in the movement steadily increased. And perhaps even in the 1950s, many black children sensed the power of collective action. And because of this ideology, their fears were allayed. So despite the fear that um, permeated the atmosphere, and the fact that so many young people could identify, just like me, even though this is like 1990s Mississippi, through my eyes, I did not distinguish between what happened in 1955 and the fact that I had just moved back to Mississippi. I'm like, look, we need to move back to Tennessee. Like, things are any better there. But, um, but of course, with that said, that, that fear could have just paralyzed those young, those young students during that time. But it was the murder of Emmett Till that actually propelled them to action. And, and that, that's, a big, that's extremely powerful, and especially seeing those images and what could happen to a black child in the 1950s Mississippi. So um, this is the response right here. And, and as you just heard, youth councils increased in their membership in the years subsequent to the murder of um, Emmett Lewis Till. Now this is uh, Amos Brown, who I just uh, showed you all in the previous image, who was the first president of the West Jackson Youth Council. And uh, by this time, he graduated from Jim Hill High School in 1959. And by this time, he was a freshman at um, a freshman, or ending his freshman year at Morehouse College. And I told you all that he came back to Mississippi to be involved in the movement. So I'm now giving you just this, this simple vignette of one, one youth activist. And what he was able to do was extremely phenomenal. Uh, the two baby sisters from the previous picture, them, uh, Amos Brown, there's uh, another young man by the name of Willis Logan, whose mother was also actively involved, <coughs> A.M.E. Logan. Um, if you all have heard of the organization Woman Power Unlimited, she was one of the founders of the organization. Willis Logan, all of them decided, and I mentioned earlier that freedom was often defined by the interactions on the day-to-day -day exchange of young people, what they were doing on a daily basis. So of course, where are they going? They're going to the fair, they're going to the zoo, they're going to the park. And of course, even just in business exchange of their parents, because they see exactly how their parents are being treated. So uh, one of the first uh, protests or boycotts or sit-ins, let me say, that Agnes Brown is able to organize, and this is right after the arrival and the arrest, or the beginning of the arrivals and arrest of freedom riders here in Jackson, uh, that Agnes Brown organizes a sit-in at the Jackson Zoo. And in response to these young people going out and sitting in, uh, the mayor decides that, oh, we're just going to remove the benches so they won't be able to have access to. Now, as I mentioned, uh, primary sources are extremely, are extremely helpful, as you all know. But uh, just in introducing you all to a few. Of course, this is one uh, Andrew May mentioned of the Sovereignty Commission files, and this is uh, by way of the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. Uh, the Sovereignty Commission, you all see this a brief history right here, founded in uh, March of 1956. This is Mississippi's um, investigative body, state, had state funded FBI for the state of Mississippi. And of course, uh, looking at ways to try to circumvent integration here in the state. And of course, investigating any one or any activity that is deemed as subversive. And here you see a, an image of Stoker Carmichael. But it, it, it's a website that's extremely easy to navigate. And if you're from Mississippi or very closely affiliated with anyone from Mississippi, 
you do nothing about type in in your name, then you'll be amazed at what you find. But you have to be careful about that as well, because there are some that we talked about snitches and informants. People being paid and sometimes in stores. Maybe they're fabricated, but there are also revolts found within the so you have to really make sure you're looking at the um, make sure that you're you're looking at the, and all of the information attached to that particular file because there may be a revolt. And Jan Hill is uh, is often the one who's who's submitting those revolts, um, and, and she is a civil rights veteran who came in during the summer. <coughs> Now this particular document is in reference to Angus Brown, so this shows even though the Sovereign Commission started following him in 1957, this, this tracks this history of documentation that the Sovereign Commission was keeping on him and his role within the NAACP and Youth Council. Um, and it, it's talking about the state conference meeting that's taking place here at the Masonic Temple just down, just down Main Street. Uh, and I mentioned my orthodontist, uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. Jones. He's even mentioned in here as being the treasurer for the organization and making reference to the fact that he has gone to the bank and deposited $46.80. And you see his address has been listed here. So they, these are high school students that we're talking about that are also being uh, closely, closely followed. Now this particular article is from the Pittsburgh Courier, 1961. So the Sovereign Commission is really collecting as much information as they possibly can, not just within the state of Mississippi, but outside of the state of Mississippi. And this is one that's talking about Angus Brown after um, he comes back and the fact that he has spoken out about what has happened. Yes. So. It said it was bound to happen sooner or later. The old DC customer referring to Negroes as boys, no matter how old they may be, backfired here last week when Angus C. Brown, 20 Jackson student leader and now Morehouse College student, challenged the white doctor's use of the term of talking to an aged Negro patient in an ambulance. Brown was arrested and charged with disturbing the peace. Police said he was loud and boisterous, tall, and upset employees. And upset employees at the hospital. <laughs> a white doctor in the emergency room of the hospital asked the aged Negro, What's wrong with you, boy? And the doctor said, Brown then spoke up saying, That's not a boy, can't you see he's a man? The doctor said, He then asked Brown, Well, what's wrong with you? He said, Brown told him, Nothing's wrong with me, and if you aren't so dumb, you know that a man, that's not a man, that's a man, not a boy. So, um, Pittsburgh Curry, you can't go wrong with them. <laughs> but uh, the great, um, great sources that you can make use of in the classroom and telling these personal narratives is really helping uh, students to understand how, how deep the commitment of young people was to, uh, was to change, change things. And you can do this within your own areas, um, especially if you are teaching at institutions here in the South. And even if you're pressing fast forward on the movement, because there are so many other youth movements that emerged out of uh, so many other social movements where young people were central to those movements that, uh, that were worked out of the civil rights movement. And last but not least, this is something that um, I wanted to share yesterday. Because I do touch on the home song, and, and this is again just my little spiel about primary sources. If you don't have the opportunity to bring veterans into your classroom, like we would probably do at uh, that we do here at Tulum and also Jackson State, uh, being able to watch these recorded interviews uh, are also great additions to enhancing your classroom instruction. And this is the sneak. Uh, digital gateways in which you can access so much information. And this is, of course, a collaboration with SNCC Legacy Project at Duke University. And of course, this is um, these are interviews from the Macomb movement. Uh, some names you may 
be familiar with based on uh, the college wife who talked yesterday, Curtis Hay, Muhammad, uh, Mary Berry, Bob O, Brenda Travis, Miss Jack, and Jacqueline Martin, who uh, was unable to be with us yesterday. But all of these are really good. Fifteen to thirty minute uh, video interviews of persons who were actively involved. Can you say who created that project? It's a collaboration between SNCC Legacy Project and Duke University. So it's the, the SNCC Digital Gateway. What's the actual if you want to go to the actual SNCC Legacy Gateway? Would that be SNCC Legacy Spell? This is a uh, snake digital document. And it launched in December of last year.
And there are some of these students here, just like Je uh, Jesse Harris and Jenny Travis. These are folks who became long-term activists in the Mississippi movement. So their activism didn't just stop in 61. But it's because of these young people's enthusiasm. And um, even though the climate of fear was strong, because of these young people's activism, uh, enthusiasm in Jackson, that's what made it possible for James Bell to make the argument for young people getting involved in Birmingham. So when we think about the national movement, we often think about Birmingham. And I'm going to pose a question to you all um, in, in my closing remarks and really try to generate some discussion. But when we think about the national narrative, we often think about Birmingham because of the media images and because of the presence, but when we think about the political structure here and those who are in uh, positions of power, these folks are watching what's going on elsewhere and trying to thwart any, um, any media presence or attention to what was going on here in the state of Mississippi. But all of this is going on, and despite the fact that you may not have known about Jackson, Jackson had a very vibrant movement that was taking place. Now, I, I keep making reference to the fact that young people's freedom rests on what they do in their day-to-day -day life. And the next couple of images just shows you how these young people were organizing and also mobilizing uh, the community around protesting and boycotting events. The State Fair, we went to the fairgrounds. The State Fair was one of those uh, contested spaces. And uh, it's a place where I often ask my students, how many of you all go to the state fair every year? Just about every hand goes up. They get excited about that. I'm like, you know, the state fair once upon a time is more than the cotton candy and the, the chicken on the stick. Somebody fought for you all to be able to go for an entire what, two weeks? Because at one point, black people were only given a few days where they could go. And once upon a time, black people could not go to this fairground. The fairgrounds was actually located down 49, which we'll be going uh, when we travel to the Delta, um, just in the dirt pasture. But uh, starting in 1960, students started organizing boycotts. And of course, they're in conversation with leadership like Major Evans about what steps to take and moving forward. And this is a handbill that students passed out for 60,000 black residents in uh, the city of Jackson. Segregation must go. Did not be a second class citizen, did not attend the segregated Mississippi State Fair. But this particular handbill is from 1951, if I'm not mistaken. But it started, these boycotts started in the city. And as you see here, this is a collective effort of Jackson students. In 1960, um, the North Jackson Youth Council was founded, and uh, the first president was a two-blue student by the name of Coley Liddell, whose family was active involved, actively involved in the movement. Uh, and to think about how young people are being politicized, socialized, because her parents did not allow her to join her brother's Negro History Club in the 1950s. She formed her own and was having these conversations about what they needed to do to change things for the black community and making sure that little black girls in her community understood the importance of black history. But um, Coley Liddell and others decided that they wanted to launch this campaign called the Sacrifice for Human Dignity. And that that's what it was all about, the Sacrifice for Human Dignity. So you have all of these youth organizations who are coming together under the auspices of the NAACP, so uh, to be able to effectively boycott the uh, state fair. Now, one of the things my mom was sharing with me because she was from rural Hines County is, uh, and you've heard of the fact that folks who were breaking the picket line, the state superintendent of education, she said when she was little, she, that they rarely came to Jackson. They were off to go the other direction because there was so much activity. In the city. But uh, at the same time, she said that the state superintendent wanted to try to make it a mandate for black schools to bring their students to the state fair. Make it look like a field trip, but really it was to make it seem as if these boycotts were ineffective. 
So the numbers started rising from year to year. Um, initially, it was about 75, 80 percent effective. And these are numbers based on what um, Major Evers and uh, Reverend R.L.T. Smith, who was another person we have not mentioned, but very important to the Jackson movement. Uh, both of them are getting together and talking about okay, what these young people are doing and how effective their activism is um, in pushing for change around this particular event. 1962, the numbers rise a little bit more. And by 1963, there is no more Jim Crow there because of these efforts that started in 1960. And Campbell College also, because it's in existence, Campbell College also had uh, was a part of this collegiate, intercollegiate chapter of the Lazy Paper. So were they able to force the schools to take the kids to the fair? Some people complied in, in certain districts. <laughs> and, and more often it was in smaller rural districts where there may have been a lot of pressure or fear. If I don't do, I'm going to lose my job. I know those are the principals who are sending the students. Yes. So when the fair was segregated, All of, the All of the vendors, did they participate on the segregated days, or are there vendors who are just like, I don't want to deal with black people on an open day? Now that's a good question. I, I haven't found anything, but that, that's a really good question. Because, because perhaps there was a, a a decrease in activity other than the rides and sales. So the money has always been green. The money has always been green. And that's exactly why there was no more Jim Crow there because you have an entire race of folks and then you're talking about people who come from all over the state of Mississippi. And fair is like big money here in Mississippi. And we're still having these conversations about how much money the fair brings into this state. So, um, yeah, that, that's, but that, that's a really good question. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's a huge deal in Jacksonville. They um, they actually built a fairgrounds next to we we have a what's Altel Stadium right now where the football team plays our, our football team. Then you have the baseball stadium right next to that, and the fairgrounds is sitting right in between those. And every year they make sure that there's one day where the there's a Saturday that the fair is open and there's a home football game the next day. So you just get that's, that's everybody. Like, that's like what Jackson State homecoming. Is, is it homecoming? So it's like, yeah, you get all these folks for homecoming, you come in and spend money in Jackson, and then okay, go over to the state for everybody here. Hand in hand. Um, and this is simply an image of students being arrested um, while uh, boycotting. <laughs> Now, in response to that, um, this is 1962, and I know the Alicia, are you still advised of the Harambe? No. No. The Harambe is a student who's I read to me. And, uh, and in thinking about how young people are really critically looking at what's going on. And uh, I know, Chris, uh, Kirsten, you're right on. Um, you know, I guess you may get you crazy. But this is uh, from the Voice of Jackson Movement, and this is for the youth, um, youth uh, produced newspaper or handout. And what it says, you can't boycott the Negro State Fair. And if you think about Birmingham, 1963, with the use of dogs and water hoses, Jackson had, there were dogs used try to disperse crowds as early as 1961 here in Jackson. So there again, and, and these, um, these uh, strategies of force to break up demonstrators. And at the bottom it says, is this Southern hospitality? And uh, this really is foreshadowing what does happen in 1963 when students, uh, when all the jails are full here in the city and students are taken to the state fairgrounds and placed in the livestock pens, which turns into a makeshift jail or concentration camp, as the number of people are referred to. The merchandise market was in this at that time. Mm -hmm. So the, when the students were put in the 
say it could have left the old place on 49, but I wouldn't say No, it where it is now. So was the merchandise mark there? At that song, was that doorway? Merchandise mark? Did they have a little Christmas holiday thing? And oh, the craft fair? And, well, I think that that's more of a Christmas thing. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. 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 Ye
And uh, that, that's something she battled with, but there's a significant amount of trauma that these young people face. And that's probably the next uh, next direction I would like to go in. Not many people are willing to share that information. And uh, you can see it on their faces. And you kind of want to push them in the direction to see if you can get them to disclose the information. But oftentimes I would just allow people to talk. But you, you, can, you can see it. And, um, and you may find other evidence that, um, that, that proves that they went through something, but many people do not say the extent of the trauma they experienced because you know, we often refer to it as PTSD. That's the, that was the nature of the beast and getting involved in the movement itself. <coughs> uh, but of course, uh, her activism was long term because she was a part of SNCC and then. Um, Working in the, in the Delta and then went on to join the Black Panther Party. And, Um, 
I was in a doctoral program working on my dissertation, and when he found out I was writing on children in the movement, he was like, you have to tell her to include this story. So I'm constantly calling him. Um, he was in the early stages of dementia, so I called as much as I possibly could to find out that he was also sharing information and telling me other people that I could talk to. Um, little did I know that El Chessie's wife because I did not know this, I did not make any connection. She was my grandmother's caregiver. And, um, and one day I just told her, I was like, Miss Chess. I, I asked the question, I was like, um, I, if I'm being too personal, you can stop me. But was your husband's name Bill for Chess? And she was like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I said, okay, well, your husband was the reason a bus boycott took place in Jackson. And she said, oh, baby, that was so long ago. <laughs> and I said, Ms. Chess, don't you know you were a part of history? <laughs> and, and I started asking her questions, and she said, you know, I put that out of my mind, but what I do remember is we packed on that bus like sardines. But of course, they weren't married at the time. But she said she she thought when I started just talking about it, she, it started coming back to her. But she said she had not talked about that in a long time. Um, so me being this close to that, that's what people have questioned more than anything. But my responsibility as a historian was to go and find documentation to support the fact that this event happened. Um, I kept it in 1947 and 1948. The documentary said 1947. And um, those years, I could not find anything. So I'm getting frustrated because my dissertation director said, look, if you don't find it, they're going to eat you alive. And I found it. And I found another. And I found another. One was um, in the Jackson Advocate, very lengthy article. And there were snippets in the other two. So, um, and, and shifting the narrative and saying that dogs were you, and pushing back the origins of the movement from Mississippi and in, in terms of youth activism in Spain, 1946, with the Lanier bus boycott. Um, I have some firm ground to stand on. Let me say that. This, this is not Daphne talking, this is me looking at the source and making use of those sources. That way, if somebody does push back, here it is, look at my citation. Yes. Um, so, I think I understand now that many of these events in Jackson preceded the events in Birmingham and Montgomery. So I'm wondering to what extent those in Montgomery and Birmingham were aware of events in Mississippi, mm -hmm. and to what extent they informed their choices, whether it's white reaction or black activism? That's a good, that's a good question because Dr. Williams expressed yesterday how Megan Edwards was going to Montgomery. So, hmm, that's something I do need to look into now that you pose the question and thinking about the media uh, and, and media presence and, of course, access to what's going on here in the state of Mississippi, whether it be through visual or print sources and if people were paying attention because of course Mississippi was considered as the entire state the toughest nut to crack and the most segregated state in the nation while Birmingham was considered to be the most segregated city in the nation and, and it is much tougher to break through a state than it is with, with the city when you think about from North Mississippi to South. But that, that's a really good question. I need to try to see if I can make any connections between what's going on. Because clearly we know Ross Barnett was like, um, well, I guess, and um, Alan Thompson. I guess I'm, I'm just entirely dialoguing about you know, why, why is it Mississippi, and this is a continuing thing, why is it Mississippi featured more in the, in the larger narrative? And so if we could find those connections, you know, it would, it would make a compelling case. That's, that's the door that John Dittman opened up for so many of us. So many of us. And that, that's why the Mississippi narrative is constantly expanding because we have scholars who are grappling with that. Maybe 
across our neck, right? This is what we're protesting, but it also works the opposite way in the existing resistance. And so it may be also to that to identify Dr. King as a part of the movement, to allow opposition to the movement, to identify who they see as the leader of the movement, and then if they just get rid of the leader, they perhaps they thought they could, you know, get rid of the movement or just stay down. down. And so it can be target to work out of the way. And then it's always the subconscious, in my opinion, um, attitude on the parts of white America to believe that black people are monolithic <coughs> and that um, we need a one leader, where the you know, movement with multiple leaders and multi centered. Um, so I think that's maybe something I was working in whether the media framed the movement. And he was very charismatic, he was good looking, he had a pretty wife, right? Really, the American family, they weren't black and they want to you know, flash on look and body, you know, with their kids in the ninth house and stuff. College. Yeah, right. College educated, more house all that. So it's, it's interesting, you know, that can work for and against. And so we, we see something of that. No, we did the Chicago Defender. Although it was in Chicago, there's lots of coverage about what was going on in Mississippi, and the Defender helped spur the Great Migration out of Mississippi, and they were able to print the news that was not able to be printed in Mississippi. And then the papers would go back down to Mississippi, and everyone would be, would be. And so that also that black Exactly. So with the black press is extremely important in black households all across the American South. I can't keep referencing the big first period because of, but that's one that I often point my students to when they're trying to find these different um, outlets to look at. And examining these various points of the movement. But that's all that you're going to say. That's all that you're going to say. Mayor. My question is for Dr. Littner. I was wondering if you could clarify. When I read your work, um, the way that I read your interpretation of the relationship between Birmingham and Jackson was that what was happening in Birmingham got especially reluctant NAACP members in Jackson to get on board with direct action because they didn't want to take want the SBLC to take over. And if that's true, then perhaps that practically is why there was more media coverage in Jackson. Um, it's, you know, because the media was powerful. So, you know, I'm wondering if, if I'm reading that correctly and also... No, I, I think you are. And I think that the, the Daphne's point here was that, uh, you know, the Birmingham movements of 62, 63 started you know, before the Jackson movement really was, was getting underway. What Daphne is saying is that all these precedents in terms of, of what was happening in the 50s and 60s uh, had a bearing on that. But no, the reason that uh, Roy Wilkins came to Mississippi uh, in, in 1963 to get himself arrested very publicly was that the NAACP was scared to death of SCLC and all the attention they were getting. So all of a sudden, and John Salter points this out on his book, the National NAACA wasn't interested at all in, uh, in what was going on in Jackson until Birmingham got all the headlines. And then all of a sudden they were interested, and then they came down, and then they shut it down. Yeah, that, that's very, very interesting point. So I'm going to talking about the national narrative, but the national narrative is a historical construction. I mean, there was more attention in uh, national than King, King. But if we really want to understand the civil rights movement, we should, there, there's a book that I think was written maybe in honor of John called Brown Work. I don't know how many of you are familiar with it or have looked at it. But it looks at all of these local movements all over the United States, and it's a pretty remarkable book. You know, and it, and it shocks my students that there was a Black Panther Party in Des Moines, Iowa. You know, the Panthers are organized in Des Moines, you know, they're everywhere. So, so I think that, the, that, that what we learn is that the movement is a function of, of all of these local movements everywhere. And that's ultimately uh, local people everywhere. No longer being afraid, no longer uh, allowing uh, the terror that, was, that we've been studying as a backdrop to Jim Crow, uh, allowing them to, to, to stop movement activity. And so really what we're seeing here is, is you said, why is Mississippi not part of the national narrative? There are all these little places 
that should be part of this national narrative, that the national narrative is local people everywhere organized in these movements challenging Jim Crow. And that's what finally convinced white supremacy. They gotta change the rules of exploitation. The old rules aren't working. You know? So I think that, that when we think about the national, there could be a new national narrative based on based on local people, you know, uh, and rather than trying to cram Mississippi into the national narrative, we should be thinking about constructing a new one. Who edited? So it's edited by Gene uh, uh, Theo Harris. Okay. Uh, who edited Groundwork? Water, water, water. Kamosi Water and Gene Theo Harris. Kamosi Water. It's truly remarkable. Um, I know that the children get to get agency and they think about their role in the family, but they're also they're also structured structured within the agency that they do have. And I wonder if you might talk about the fact that the tension between their parents and those who sit because we keep hearing like how does a lot of people talk to other my parents really didn't feel they even had raised me. But what about those parents who were opposed to it? What was that conversation among the parents about children being engaged, being active, or about children not that anybody really have a conversation about that? Bobby Hamm is a good example of that. And, and the fact that um, a number of middle class black, their children were getting involved, and then they were highly against their children being part of the, the crusade at that time. Um, here in Jackson, most of the people I interviewed, um, most of the people I interviewed, they, their parents were involved in the movement, or they simply got involved in the movement by quote unquote peer pressure, the fact that, oh, my friends are involved, so I'm going to get involved, and of course, you start understanding what this movement is really about, it's like, oh, you know what? I, I, I think I'm doing something that's right. Um, I have one person that I interviewed whose mother was a domestic, and really, um, you would think in a, an instance like that there would be some conflict, but the mother supported her activism within the movement. But I think that, that there has been some documentation of what took place in Birmingham with the children's crusade around parents that were very unsupportive of their children and saying, no, you need to stay at home, don't get involved. And um, yeah. so, yeah. <laughs> Chris and Alicia. We keep talking about the national narrative and really that's a construct. That's that's something that people create to go in a direction that they want. And I was thinking about that when you were talking about the various people who you were talking to who didn't want their names and or people who say, oh, that was so long ago, I don't even remember. And I, I have to tell you, that just makes me boil inside. When, well, you know, I just put that out of my mind. How can you put water hoses out of your mind? And if we want, if we want this to be something where people are aware of what happened, then somebody's got to tell their story. And it can't just be what was printed in the newspapers or what was printed based on what we think happened, we have to hear the story that we didn't even know happened. I mean, that, that 1946 bus boycott, no one knew that even happened. And if somebody hadn't told their story, then we still wouldn't know it ever happened. And that's a major turning point in how things happen from, from that point on. Each of these is a brick in this wall, and the wall's not created if we don't have all of those bricks. So when you sit down and you're talking to these people and and they are reluctant either because they, they don't want to speak or they don't want their name spoken. And I know that you have a duty to to not out somebody. But do you try to encourage them to say, we really need your story? <laughs> they'll, they'll share the story, but it's like, um, I'll let you use it, but don't use my name. I get those fictitious names, you? Yeah. Yeah. You have trouble with that one. Yeah, you do. <laughs> <laughs> you have somebody who's trying to find who that person is. Let me talk to them. But let, let me say something to Dr. Matthew Moore alluded to yesterday in his introduction to Paul Swackey. 
um, Reverend Billy Kyle, who we used to see regularly when we were, had the Landmarks uh, program for NEH, and when we would go to Memphis, he would be one of our speakers. And I think one of the most profound quotes that, uh, that he made was that trailblazers don't often live to see walk through the trail that blaze. So, um, and that's far back, and I don't know how I remember that, but it just it sent chills up my spine when, when he made that statement. But I mean, that, that's true. And of course, that's the reason why I'm trying to get people to share their stories. Uh, and then I guess it speaks to what we do in the classroom and, and trying to get our students to understand that there, there is a story for everything, uh, even if it's down to sitting at the feet of our grandparents and, and just wanting to know what their experiences are uh, during a certain period of time. I talked to World War II. And I had one student when I was at the University of Mississippi to ask, to tell me, oh, well, I went and talked to my grandfather. And he said, everything you said was true. Even down to watching the Walt Disney cartoons, the shorts, at the movie theater, and trying to garner support for American involvement in World War II. So everybody's story is important, but it's about really trying to drive home to that person if they're reluctant to share that story, to share their name, or if you clearly understand that they're leaving bits and pieces out intentionally, that, that there's importance that in every, every narrative to share. Uh, Alicia and Kelly. Um, my comment was just about, about the media, and I know we talked a lot about that. I'm not sure as far as, 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 far as Bergman or Alabama is concerned, but I know in Mississippi, um, we have to look at the fact that the media was controlled by white men, right? And so especially here, there was this concerted effort not to pay attention to what the black community was doing not to show, not to mention protests and things like that. And so it wasn't by accident that it stayed out of the media, it was on purpose. And so that's why stories, and I'm sure the stories that you got were pretty much the advocate or other papers like the Courier or the Chicago Tribune for that matter, as far as Michigan these things. So it wasn't by accident. Mississippi wanted to stay out of the national news when it came to segregation because they believed they could keep it the way it was. And so we don't tell people what's going on, we don't show people what's going on. Nobody can come in and try to make a change. We don't have a problem. Well, the other side of that is, is trying to make, make protesters, demonstrators look like a bad guy. Mm -hmm. So that, that, that's constantly upheld in like the Jackson Daily News and the Clarence mm -hmm. Legend mm -hmm. and, and outside agitators, just in the language that's being used. And uh, even mm -hmm. using mm -hmm. racial mm -hmm. epithets mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. uh, news. And yeah. then, like, you talk about how the national news coverage, most of the time, by local affiliates. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have the local affiliates that cover these stores, there's no reason. Yes, and I remember reading somewhere um, Virginia, there was a affiliate of Virginia that covered the store about Mississippi. And then somebody you noticed know, in the report of the Board of Court Patrick, but they were scared to come to Mississippi. Mm -hmm. So there was also this fear around me. If I go to Mississippi, I may not come back. So mm -hmm. just don't go. And I think that's that's a big reason why we don't see Mississippi in that in that I work on, I work under a very fierce IRB at the University of Iowa and I come from the idea of informed consent, you know, coercion. You know, people you might see it on their face at the end, you just can't go there or you should, they say no, you have to stop. And and respect the you know, you know what they've got to tell us is something we need to hear. We have to respect their right to keep it to themselves and also stay in line in line with our funding and our if we're doing this for the university what we're being bound by. So I, I find that frustrating a lot, but it is what it is. And you know, we can't really change someone's name if they say don't do this. And there's just things that we, as researchers, we're bound by. And how do we respect that and also get the story? That's, that's the tough part. Yeah, with recent changes in um, IRB, oral histories, um, no longer fall under that. But I still have folks fill out a consent form and, and try to honor and respect whatever it is their wishes are as a part of me getting the hearing here. Here's some of the latest comments about the media. Can be applied to this question about uh, where Mississippi falls or does not fall in the national narrative or just the things that we've been repeating each day. Because when you think about the lingering effects or energy around Mississippi, there is this like distance from the state as a whole. Like there are people to this day who will say things like, 
I don't even want to go to Mississippi, or I've never been to Mississippi, um, and it seems like not only foreign, but um, a safe store that, that, that comes here. And I, I feel like the thing that she was saying about how media had that much control to maintain what they could control um, as far as the things that were happening in the state could be a very clear example as to why these stories aren't, you know, present or um, widely circulated within the narrative because to do so, it's almost like we can acknowledge and identify the horrors or even the triumphs or whatever the case may be. But to do so will also reveal all these other things, which speaks to some previous speaker who said that like none of these events happen in vacuum. So like once you unpack one thing, that means like this person is gonna be revealed, this thing is gonna be revealed, and so it gets really complicated. And I've always like struggled with just Southern culture as a whole because it reflects that energy in a lot of ways. Even like the uh, we're talking about locality. Um, as far as geography, but even when you think about localities within like families or educational spaces, like it turns into this continued narrative where you see it's kind of like a tree that it's not only the civil rights movement, it's also that's just the historical reference that shows it on a larger scale. But we can trace this to like how family traditions are born or how interactions within uh, particular post spaces are born. And then, so that was my conclusion. But then to Chris, I'm really curious to know, like, when you, I, I, this is a, a question for you, but I'm just saying what you said, maybe you think about this, but like, when you sit in a room or on a phone or anything with a person after you have decided that your project is also like, you're like, yep. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm going to do this and it's going to be great. I know all the places to look. I keep finding more books. So I found another person. But when you sit there, you do, there are these moments where you just get really, you, there are potential conflicting moments where you're just like, uh, kind of what Dr. Williams was saying today, like, you get this responsibility of like, now I know this story. And yes, we want to tell a story because it might be the missing piece, and you know, that's the goal. But then you have a responsibility now to the person that you just talked to, and then everything gets undone. You know, and now you have to, Think about like who am I now that I know this? Should I? I mean, how am I going to tell the story? You know, or how do I even position it now? Yeah, now it's on you to figure those things out. And I don't know that it's always as cut and dry as it was in the intent. And um, I know personally, I have just like completely stopped looking for things or talking to people because you you hit you get these constant moments where you're you're making games. Because you have an interview schedule, and you're working through it. But then when you get done, like transcribing the interview or sitting with information, it's not like, yeah, this is going to change how we think about dogs and water hoses. You know, it's like this was a human being and that was connected to this family who usually these people are still living. Like, I've talked to people in Jackson that would tell me things like, oh, they live like down the street. Like, hey, they're right over here. I go to church with them. Or she runs the Everett Institute. Like, these people are still here, and the second that you write the book, now it's like, you told her? <laughs> <laughs> and maybe, maybe it won't be a negative thing, you know, maybe it will. Maybe it will spark more conversation um, for other people to do the work, but it's, it's not, it's very complicated. And I think that when you're doing oral history or ethnographies or anything to that nature, like the ethics of the research, we have, uh, as, as scholars, we have equal responsibility to talk about ways to handle those things as much as we do to publish information because you have people who aren't invested as much as maybe we are to come to an institute like this, get the information. They're just like, oh, the civil rights movement? The civil rights movement? Let me find the gap. Let me mind the gap. Let me report this story. But they're not thinking about the lives and the families and the individuals that are all connected to these things. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I do understand that. I, I don't think that we can diminish that you're, these are real people. I mean, we're looking at pictures, but these are real people. But I look at, you know, every now and then if I catch my mom in the right mood, and you know, the grandkids have been over, so she's, she's liking me a little bit. Um, I can get a story out of her. And it's, okay, you know there's a monument downtown that's talking about this person that you said, Y'all used to hang out at the soda shop together. 
yeah, you know, that was just my best friend from, from high school. Okay, that's significant, and your children don't even know this. Never mind, it's not even in a book. I think at least you, your children and your grandchildren should know that you knew these people or, or that you met this person who's, because these are the stories that you, I didn't pass on to them, and they then pass on to their kids. And maybe 50 years after she's dead, it might end up in a book because it is important. And maybe you can't say right now about that person who was a part of the civil rights movement and helped to change something because they are still alive and, and there may be retribution. But at least if you know the story and you've written the story down somewhere and you've told somebody the story, then the story doesn't die with that person. Think about how much history dies with the person when they die. And it's not just, oh, well, that was 50 years ago, so it doesn't matter. It does still matter. Oh, I, I don't even think about that. I put that out of my mind. You haven't really, if I can say one or two things, and you can call forth all of this stuff that brings forth this emotion. We can't let so much history keep dying with the people who live the history. And one of my last slides is going to make reference to what you just said. And in thinking about family, I had the, the Jackson Movement exhibit of, at my family reunion a couple of years ago, and randomly I had family like, oh, that's Calvin right there. <laughs> <laughs> like, who is Calvin? Where is he? I need to interview him. <laughs> but, but you're right, it's, there's so much of this history is being lost, and um, I, I will show a picture that, that speaks to that. Okay, so my, um, my book is like built around oral history. Like I interviewed these people who worked in, the in that industry. And I found that in those places they don't want you to go, um, commonly there were a few reasons. First of all, because some of the stuff, um, like I'm looking at the poultry industry and how, you know, how hard the labor is. It's like it's still traumatic for them. They don't want to talk about it. But I also found that sometimes people don't, it's a matter of pride. Like people don't want to tell stories where it seems like they were oppre oppressed or like they didn't have agency or whatever. But also I think um, one thing I have to realize like as a scholar, this and this is my project, this is a big deal to me. So even though those things that um, might seem small or like significant to me and I can't you know I can't believe you knew this person. I can't believe you took this action. I can't believe you bought food or whatever. But to them because it was just like part of their everyday life, it wasn't a big deal. It was like, I, you know, you, we can see the big picture and we're thinking about it in those terms. We're weaving the story or weaving all these stories together. But what they know is like their individual story, right? And they didn't want to like, um, you know, they're just like, I'm just good, you know, yeah, I had problems and yeah, I went to the union store or yeah, I went to the supervisor, but that's just my individual story. So how can that be important? And sometimes because they don't see those things as important, they don't disclose them to you or whatever. So, um, I mean, that's just my experience, like, and especially if there was, like, a lot of, you know, like, a lot of pride. Like, they didn't want to seem like, you know, they read these stories about, oh, the poor poultry processing workers, and this industry is so hard, and still the jungle, you know, they have all those topics. And they want to be like, that's not my story, you know, I stood up for myself, or, um, yeah, it could be hard, but I made it, and I did all these things because I had this job or whatever. So I found, I found a lot of that. I think there's a lot of different reasons why people don't disclose or why they don't want certain things to talk about. So um, thank you all. And, and I'm, I'm really interested to hear any feedback from, uh, from you all the questions you all have asked. I actually helped me to the things of expanding the project. Um, but just in closing, of course, um, Birmingham. Dog, but I just presented to you this image right here, uh, 1962 on the political cartoon. Uh, but of course, Mississippi, James <coughs> Brown, uh, Michael Bryan's book, oh, We Shall Not Be Moved, which looks at the 1963 Jackson Woolworth sit in. Uh, of course, this is an iconic image in which the media was able to uh, capture what was going on in this very moment. Uh, Michael O'Brien is also currently working on a book on the two rule nine. Um, not sure when when he plans on releasing that, but that is forthcoming. But um Were they sure. yes. 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 Can I just start? Oh yeah, and movies. But the other piece that when I talk to my students about this image, I'm like, we talk about youth activism 
there's also youth resistance. So if we talk about massive resistance, white resistance to black freedom, that's those are the faces behind them. Those are high school students uh, from Central High School. But we cannot, and it's important, we don't forget that those people are now the same age as the civil rights veterans. Mm -hmm. and, you know, and the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree with activism, and the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree with massive resistance. So if activists come out of activist families, you know, it, it, it happens on all sides. Right, they're telling their stories too. They are. Yeah, I've, I've recently had a conversation with a neighbor. <laughs> we are. I'm curious about that.
not just the South, but guess what particular group? White men are black women. And where the South? Oh, but isn't that interesting? <laughs> okay. Uh, just quickly, fairgrounds all across the American South were makeshift detention centers. But this is 13-year-old um, Jane Young, which you all saw in the video. And uh, of course, uh, family very actively involved in the movement. And just in looking at this image, I'm going to recite a poem by Margaret Walker Alexander, um, written in 1963, and I know that some of you all um, literature is, is your thing. I was just fortunate to grow up in a household with somebody who was always going. <laughs> and then she saw the importance of this particular poem for my research purposes, but um, yeah, don't use this except for in your classroom. This is, this is a lot of personal images in here. Uh, of course, they, they are just for me uh, until the time. Um, but of course, Dr. Dr. Young has been passed a couple of years ago. But uh, we're hoping to be arrested and hoping to go to jail. We'll sing and shout and pray for freedom and for justice and for human dignity. The fight may be long and some of us will die. But liberty is costly. And Rome, they say to me, was not built in one day. Hurry up, Lucille, hurry up. We're going to miss our chance to go to jail. So that's, that's Margaret Walker Alexander and those last two lines. Hurry up, Lucille, an eight-year-old girl who she was served and actively involved in the Jackson Civil Rights Movement. That's from an adult's perspective, but this is from a 17-year-old freedom school student's perspective on what needs to change in the state of Mississippi and what she deems as being the best uh, of an integrated society. And of course, I've been using, um, I know that Brandon Freedom School poetry, uh, there's a book called Writing the Light of Freedom, William Starkey and John Hale, that goes through uh, a lot of the poetry that was written by free school, some, uh, free school students during 1964. But um, this speaks to the various moments in which young people were involved in the movement, whether Alice Jackson was trying to convey that through this poem or not. Um, I want to walk the streets of town, turn into a restaurant and sit down and be served with food of my choice and not be met with a hostile voice. I want to live in the best hotel for a week or go for a swim at a public beach. I want to go to the best university and not be met with violence or uncertainty. I want the things my ancestors thought we'd never have. They'd be mine as a Negro in America and I should have them or be dead. Young people were involved in the beach weigh-ins in, in the Lux, Mississippi. Children were involved. Of course, James Mary, the University of Mississippi, 1962, the integration of that institution. Of course, right here in the city of Jackson, all across the American South, children were sitting in. Even though we think about 1963 with uh, the Woolworth sitting in, we rewind 1960s with the Greensboro sitting in. But as early as 1957, there were sitting ins taking place in other areas that were being initiated by young people were a part of the NAACP council. There was also this march on Washington for integrated schools by young people that took place in the late 50s that people don't often make reference to. But Chris, this picture, this uh, particular slide speaks to what you were talking about, not allowing, allowing this story to die with uh, the persons who helped to make this history, whether it be a part of their everyday lives. Uh, the top image is from one of the first Civil Rights Veterans Conferences I went to that focused on youth participation in the Civil Rights Movement. And uh, that was where I heard Hollis Watkins say that, that they would tell the older generation in Macomb, Mississippi, step aside so we don't have to step over. Uh, across the top, that is from 2007, the presentation that I gave with uh, the Hamer Institute with the Fannie Lou Hamer Memorial uh, Murdis Minor, that is the person who was the secretary for the organizing committee for that 1946 bus boycott whose uncle served as who provided the cab service for those students to get to and from school and for the community to also support uh, that boycott. This is her sister who uh, 
uh, was not, she was just a little bit younger than she is. And of course, for those of us in here who know, that's Chuck Nature, and this is Frankie Adams Johnson, but all three of them, young people, had to be involved in the Mississippi movement. Here, we have Hollis Clarkson. Um, not sure how many of you have heard of the, the source, his story is taking sides. Um, James Sorrell is uh, one of the authors of the book. And of course, here, Jimmy Travis. Uh, the one thing that I do regret, I knew Mr. Travis very well, but I did not have the opportunity to interview Mr. Travis while he was alive. So all of that information about his time in the Jackson movement, I lost because I didn't act quickly enough. But that, that's, um, that, these are people who, of course, were very instrumental in my research. And of course, uh, they, they proved the power and authenticity of all histories. But then again, as I stated earlier, there are some problems that we as scholars must make sure we are walking through. Brown, yes, and that's Renee Romano, who looked at um, uh, memorialization of, of the civil rights movement and memory. So this brings us to the end. <laughs> Thank God for Mississippi and keep South Carolina from being at the bottom of the list. <laughs> that was then, but for purposes of this particular presentation, thank God for Mississippi because it helps place the national narrative. Uh, in, in a much broader context, and we understand the importance of local movement histories and how they can help us to really enhance how we teach the civil rights movement. So thank you all. It has been my pleasure. I'm open to feedback. And here are some tools you can use. Not a comprehensive list, but a couple of things around children's activism in the movement that uh, you might be able to use in the classroom.